Hi, and welcome to Roswell United Methodist Church. My name is Michael Cromwell, and I have the joy of serving as one of the associate pastors here at RUMC. Thanks for joining us for our on-demand version of the sermon, which will be delivered later today. If you'd like to watch our services live, you can do so via our live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15. Notice our different worship times and our different hours that we have now. You'll also be able to see the entire worship service service on demand later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. We are so glad that you are with us today. We're thankful for your presence and we're thankful for your generosity and the different ways that you are helping to make RUMC a place of community and faith. Let's have a word of prayer before we hear our sermon. Gracious and loving God, we love you so much and we are grateful for this day and this day that we have to worship you. May the words that we are to hear, may they not only pierce our ears, but pierce our hearts as well, that we might be changed in different people because of what you have to say to us today. We thank you and we love you all in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Now let's hear our sermon from today. This morning I'll be reading from the Gospel of John, chapter 21, starting at verse 4, and I'll be reading 4 through 17. This is what it says. But when the day was now breaking, Jesus stood on the beach, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus therefore said to them, children, do you, have any, you do not have any fish, do you? They answered him, no. And he said to them, cast the net on the right-hand side of the boat and you will find a catch. They cast therefore, and then they were not able to haul it in because of the great number of fish. That disciple, therefore, whom Jesus loved, said to Peter, it is the Lord. And so when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put his outer garment on, for he was stripped for work, and threw himself into the sea. But the other disciples came in the little boat, for they were not far from land, but about 100 yards away, dragging the net full of fish. And so when they got out upon the land, they saw a charcoal fire already laid and fish placed upon it and bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish which you have now caught. Simon Peter went up and drew the net to land full of large fish, 153. And although there were so many fish, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples ventured to question him, who are you? knowing that it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave them and the fish likewise. This is now the third time that Jesus was manifested to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. So when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my lambs. And he said to him again a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said, shepherd my sheep. He said to him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him a third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, tend my sheep. Pray with me. Lord, in these old words, Breathe on us the power of your Spirit. You, the Word, might come into our lives and, and make us more like you. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. It's possible, from the way that I speak, you may have guessed I'm from the South. Yep. Not Boston. I probably not any little hint of Boston accent in me because I've been there several times, but nope, don't sound like it. Some may have guessed Canada, but nope, not from Canada. I'm from the South. And there are a few things that are a little different about the South than in other places. One of those things is an irrational fear of snow. That, if you've lived in the South any time at all, you know that it, Southerners are just it's irrational, don't know why, it's just snow is just no bueno, and so we're scared to death of it. The second thing is, in the South, everyone in the South 
has one, at least one person in their family that is just a little off-center. Their bubble is not exactly online. I mean, it's uh, a little eccentric, a little quirky. It might be that Aunt Martha or Uncle Billy that just, you, you knew exactly who I said everybody in the South has one person in their family, and that, that person came to mind. Well, if that person didn't come to mind, guess what? That person is you. <laughs> Everybody in the South has at least one person in their family that's kind of quirky, a little bit eccentric. And the other thing about the South is that Southerners don't know how to say goodbye. I was in high school. My sister was in college. She brought home a friend. And the friend ate meal with us. We had supper together, enjoyed it. We laughed. We talked. The friend said goodbye. And guess what? They left. Oh, and the rest of us were looking around. What did we, did we offend him? What did we do? I, Bill, I, I knew it was my brother Bill, said something offensive. I didn't know what it was, but I, well, it turned out he wasn't from the South. And he was from an area of the country where you do what you say. You say goodbye and then you leave. That's not what you do in the South at all. In the South, you say, I've enjoyed the meal. It's been a lovely evening. I need to go. And that doesn't mean a thing. It means that it's time for second dessert or maybe you're going to move into the den and pass around a popcorn or something. It, break out a board game. There are lots of things you're going to do, but it doesn't mean goodbye. The second time you say, you know, the kids, you blame it on the kids. The kids have to get up in the morning and, and we really need to ha go now. Well, all that means is you're going to go to the door and visit for a little while longer. The third goodbye might mean it's time to go to the car, but Southerners don't know how to say goodbye. That's how I know John is from the South. He doesn't know how to say goodbye. I don't know if it's South of Galilee or South Israel. He just doesn't know how to say goodbye. He has written one of the most beautiful books in all of the Bible. And when I say beautiful, I mean literary. The, the, the literary devices, that he, there's common themes, that the, the sentences are complete. That if you go to study ancient Greek, that John is the first place that you, you open because the sentences are understandable. It's polished. And there's a beginning, a middle, and an end of the book. That in the beginning of the book, he says, in Jesus was life, that it's a book of life. Seventy-eight times from the beginning to the end of the book, he mentions life. And Jesus himself, John 10.10, 10, says, I have come that you might have life and have it abundantly. Chapter 14, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. That it's a book about Life, 78 times he's written about it. And, and then at the, at the climax of the book, it's the resurrection of Jesus. There have been seven miracles and only seven miracles throughout the book. Seven miracles to, to go along with the seven days of creation. And now the eighth miracle is the resurrection. And the resurrection takes place on the first day of the week. The same way the old creation took, started on the first day of the week and took seven days, this new creation, it starts, starts on the first day. The old creation started in a garden. The new creation, the empty tomb, it's in a garden. The old creation that Adam has the, the breath of God breathed into his nostrils and he becomes a living being is what Genesis chapter 2 says. Well, the new creation, it starts when Jesus, it says he opened his mouth and he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. New life in a new creation. It begins when the, the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit is breathed on disciples like you and me and it begins in the here and now for you and for me when we receive the, the Holy Spirit. And then John ties all this up into a bow at the end of chapter 20, verse 30, and this is what he says. He says, excuse me, verse 31, he says, but these things have been written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life 
in his name. It's a book about life in Jesus Christ. That it's not like the old creation, it's a new life. A life in Jesus Christ. Well, it's obviously the end of the book. He tells why the book's written. It's written that you might believe in Jesus and in believing in Jesus you might have life. Dun, dun. Seems like the very end. But then there's one more book. <laughs> Excuse me, one more chapter. Verse, ch- chapter 21. Chapter 21 is it's just one more dessert, one more story, and another thing. I, there's just one more thing. I want to make sure that you know. And those are the verses that we read this morning. Those are the verses that we read this morning. That the disciples, there's seven of them. There's seven of them that they, they go back to work. This isn't just wetting a hook and let's, you know, talk about what all's happened. No, they've seen the risen Christ. They've seen Jesus risen from the dead twice already. And now it's time to go back to work. They're fishing, and they fish all night. They don't catch a thing. Then a voice from the shore calls out to them. They don't recognize that it's Jesus. And he calls out to them. He says, cast your nets on the right-hand side of the boat, and you will find a catch, verse 6. Well, the person who would know least about where the fish are is somebody on land, They don't know where the currents are. They can't see the swells. They haven't been fishing all night. But it's the the really miraculous thing is that they obey. They obey. The small thing. They obey in in the small thing. And life in Christ is a life of obedience. Obedience even in the small things. And our God is a God of small things. Jesus talks about mustard seed faith. As small as it is, it's big enough to move a mountain. Jesus talks about our God is a God of small things, that, that faith is like a yeast. It's just the smallest little amount, but it, it makes the whole lump of dough rise. That our God is a God of small things. It was a small boy with five loaves and two fish that Jesus took his little, blessed it, and fed 5,000. That it's obedience in the small things. Obedience in the small things. If you feel distant from God, try obedience. And it may be obedience in the small things. In the things that maybe to you seem insignificant. Jesus said in John 14, 15, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. So often we think of love as as, as a feeling, but that's not what he's calling the disciples then and the disciples now to. He's calling us to an obedience. Where yes, we love, but we, we love now, a love that has the seed in the emotions, the, the, the word love here, agape, has its seat in the will. It's a decision. It's an action. It's what we do. And it's Jesus who gives us power to do when, well, we don't feel like it. It's Jesus who gives us power to love, not just those who are lovely, but even those who, well, the Bible says are Enemies, love your enemies is what Jesus says. That the call of Jesus is to love not just the lovable, but the stranger. Maybe even the one that, well, in the case of Jesus, the one that has denied him or betrayed. It's a It's a love that has power that we don't have. It's a love that sometimes it's, it's obvious, but many times it's a love that starts in the things that no one sees. Psalm 139 verse 23 says, Search me, O God, and know my heart, and try me and know my anxious thoughts. 
And if there be any hurtful way in me, lead me. Lead me to the everlasting way. That it's, it begins in the small things, in the heart, and in the mind. Those things that we practice. Those hurtful things that m- maybe nobody else knows about, but, but you and I do. It might be practicing contempt, practicing the grudge, practicing the time we were hurt, practicing going on the offensive, practicing the, those, those deeds of the heart, those deeds of the heart that rob us of, well, that rob us of life, practicing those stories those stories that we tell ourselves that have nothing to do with being a child of God, but those stories that, that want to make us believe that we're less than. John tells us in chapter 1, verse 12, as many as received him, to them he gave the power, that's a key word, power to become children of God. That it's not our goodness, not our loveliness, not our lovableness, it's power. The power of the risen Christ that gives us strength and power to be children that obey God, that obey God in the small stuff and and know life. Life in Jesus is a life of obedience, obedience in the small things. But it's also a life of abundance. And that's the second thing that I want to talk about this morning. Verse 11 says, Simon, Simon Peter went up and drew the net to the land full of large fish, 153. That's abundant. There's seven of them out fishing, and now they're beside the fire f- for breakfast with 153 fish. Well, I hope they're hungry because that's over 21 fish per person. <laughs> Our God is an abundant God, and all the way through the Gospels, it's Jesus that wants us to know that this this new life, this new creation, it's a life and a creation of abundance. The first miracle in the Gospel of John, Jesus is at a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and his mother comes to him and says, they have no more wine. Well, Jesus instructs the the server, says, fill the, the, the pots all the way to the brim. And the word that he used for pot is a ceremonial cleansing pot that holds between 20 and 30 gallons each. There's six of them. That's between 120 and 180 gallons of water. They fill them to the brim. And Jesus changes the water into wine. Not just enough to get by, not just enough for that day. It's an abundance. Our God is an abundant God. Philippians 4.19 says, My God shall supply your needs according to His riches in glory in Christ Jesus. And what are the riches of God? They're abundant. They're flourishing. They're overflowing. They're more than enough. The old creation wants you and me to live in fear. A fear of scarcity. That there's never enough. So we have to hoard, we have to gain, we have to grab, and we have to approach this world with with closed fists. But Jesus has, has breathed new life into you and to me. When we receive His Spirit, yes, we receive new life that obeys Him in the in the small things, but a life that's abundant, abundant and, and, and we, we, we approach this world not with scarcity, but with giving and generosity, with open hands. That it's His riches that are supplied and they're all around us. He gives us eyes to see those riches and to give, and to give freely. A new life in Jesus is a life of abundance. It's a life of obedience. And the last thing that I want to talk about this morning, it's a new life of forgiveness. Three times, three times in this story, one of the most well-known stories in the Bible, 
Jesus asks Peter, do you love me? And three times Peter says, yes. Why three times? Well, it's been three times that Peter denied knowing Jesus. That when Jesus was being led away to the mock trial, Peter wanted to stay close, but not too close where they would know who he was or where he'd get in trouble. But when he was going into the courtyard, it was a slave girl who saw him and said, you're one of his disciples. He said, I am not. Well, inside the courtyard, he's there standing around the fire and someone else recognizes. He denies knowing Jesus. Jesus told him that he would do it. And even though he told him, he doesn't have power enough, power enough that it's fear that overtakes him. So he denies him a second time. He backs away from the fire and a third time. He denies knowing Jesus. And that's when the rooster crows, just like Jesus said it would. And now Jesus is offering three times forgiveness. The Gospel of John wants to make sure that you and I know that the, the message of the cross is the message of forgiveness. And so just one more story, just one more story to make sure that, that you and I don't miss it. The new life, new life, we're offered forgiveness. Forgiveness. One of the best friends I've ever had is a fellow named Bob Christopher. He and I went to four-year-old kindergarten together. We went through school all the way from first grade to the, to the end of school, played football, baseball, basketball. In college, we would get jobs together in the summer. After college, he moved to Dallas, Texas, and we still th have stayed in touch. And he, uh, w I was in his wedding he, years later, he, he wrote a book called Simply Gospel, Simply Grace. And in this book, Simple Gospel, Simply Grace, he, he developed a radio program called Basic Gospel. It's syndicated throughout the United States and even into Canada. And people will call and ask questions about the Bible, ask questions about his book, or maybe about a verse that they've posed for the day. One day, we were talking, and I said, what's the question that people ask most? He said, that's easy. He said, they believe that they're beyond the reach of God's forgiveness. They think that there's something that they've done that's too great, too bad, or too awful for God to forgive. That's the message of the cross. It's why Jesus gave his life for you and for me that we would know forgiveness. It's the message of the just one more story that, that we'll know that what Jesus did, it's enough to forgive Peter, so certainly it's enough to forgive you and to forgive me. He rose from the grave with power, power that, that even Peter didn't have before the resurrection that Peter has now, and you and I do too. It's the risen Christ, His Spirit, living on the inside of us to receive that forgiveness. This morning, it may be that you, you believe that there's something that you've done that's too great, too bad, too awful to forgive. And you've never asked for, for that, that forgiveness. Or maybe you've asked and you just didn't feel forgiven. Well, Jesus never intended our forgiveness to depend on something as flimsy as emotions. That's why he gave his life on the cross. That we might know his forgiveness. That's why he rose from the grave, that we might know new life in his name. And that it's a life of forgiveness. Forgiveness offered to you and me, and we can offer that life to others as well. Or it may be that this morning that you've not known a life of obedience. Oh, it's not like you're robbing banks or you've been killing people. By the way, if you are doing those, today's a good day to stop that it's the small things, it's the things that nobody notices, the things, that, the things that are in your heart, the things that are in your mind that you've been practicing, 
that have nothing to do with the new creation that Jesus has made you. And today you need His, His power to obey even in the small things. Well, I want to pray with you and pray with you now. Let's pray. Jesus, you have the power that we don't have. And that's the power that we need now. Power for life. Where your Holy Spirit lives in and through us this day. As a new creation, we began to, to live your life. One of forgiveness. Lord, with the strength of your hand, the hand that was nailed to the cross, the hand that, that killed sin and power of that old creation, of the fear, of the shame, the hand that, that took away that power that, that you might give us power this day. We might know your forgiveness and live as a new people. Or it may be that it's a life of obedience that in the small things we've not been obedient. We begin to practice hurtful ways, maybe so small others can't see them in our hearts and our minds, but we know and you know. Give us power, the power as children of God, a power that obeys and follows you because it's the strength of your hand that gives power and our wills to act and to follow you. Or it may be, Lord, that we received that power to be obedient, but we're still a fearful people. And we've been li living a life of scarcity. We've been grabbing and trying to gain and to hoard. And there's not been a life of abundance in us at all. Breathe the fresh wind of your spirit on us this day. And we might open our hands, our lives in abundance to you and to others. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thanks again for joining us today. Um, just a reminder, if you'd like to watch the entire worship service, you can do so via live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15 a.m. You can also view the service on demand a little bit later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. Also, if you have any prayer requests, we would love to hear about those. You can send those in to pray at rumc.com. Also, if you'd like to give of your tithes and your offerings, you can do that online as well. And that's at rumc.com slash giving. Uh, thanks again for joining us today and for honoring God with your presence. We hope and pray that you have a wonderful week and we look forward to seeing you again next week. Hi, thank you for joining us. My name's Tom Davis. I'm senior pastor here at Roswell United Methodist Church. Our mission here at RUMC is to help people live a Christ-centered life. We're a welcoming church, we're a biblical church, and we're a compassionate church. That the, we believe that the way that, that God made us, that He made us in His image. And what the Bible tells us is that His image is an us, is an our. When God said in the creation story, let us create humans in our image, He made us to be in community together. He made us to connect to Him and one another. That's the place that this is at Roswell United Methodist Church, a place of community and faith. I want to invite you to join us. It might be online, it might be through social media, or it might be here in person. We meet at 9 o'clock in a contemporary service with a band. We also have two 1115 services. One is here in the sanctuary with a traditional choir, an organ. We also meet at 1115 with a band in our chapel. Thank you for joining us, and I look forward to meeting you.